our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. In the waters of baptism, Margaret died with Christ and rose with him to new life. May she now share with him in eternal glory. baptism, Margaret also received the sign of the cross. May she now share in Christ's victory over sin and death. Father Burt, thank you once again for coming this afternoon uh, on behalf of the Oliver family to celebrate this Mass of Christian burial and resurrection for Margaret Cecile, Cecile Oliver. We feel our grief and we feel our loss for this great woman, Catherine, mother, grandmother, spouse great-grandmother and member of the community. We celebrate such a great life, well-lived, and in the example of Christ and his mother Mary. And so in gratitude and in faith in the resurrection, let us pray. God of loving kindness, listen favorably to our prayers, strengthen our belief that your son has risen from the dead and our hope that your servant Margaret will also rise again. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated.
A reading from the book of Revelation. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, God's dwelling is with the human race. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will always be with him as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death or mourning, wailing or pain. For the old order has passed away. The one who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give a gift from the spring of life-giving water. The victor will inherit these gifts, and I shall be his God and he will be my son. The word of the Lord.
reading from the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians. We do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, about those who have fallen asleep, so that you may not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose, so too will God, through Jesus, bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Indeed, we tell you this, on the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will surely not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself, with a word of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, will come down from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, console one another with these words. The word of the Lord. Thanks. From the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, Amen, amen, I say to you. It was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. For I told you that, although you have seen me, you do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will not reject anyone who comes to me. Because I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. And this is the will of the one who sent me that I should not lose anything of what he gave me, but that I should raise it on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I shall raise him 
on the last day. The Jews murmured about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? Do we not know his father and mother? Then how can he say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, Stop murmuring among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him, and I will raise him on the last day. It is written in the prophets, They shall all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to my Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert, but they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat it and not die. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. I also want to welcome those who are joining us virtually and also in spiritual communion today. It's so great to have all of you with us as we've been doing throughout this pandemic to unite ourselves as much as possible. And today to feel the unity that we have in God and also in Margaret. Thanks so much for choosing these readings and how they speak to us in a very, very special way as people of faith and uh, see how they apply to us and also to Margaret. This uh, first reading is from Revelation, and uh, I'm so glad that you chose it. I don't often hear it chosen for, for funerals. It has a very, very special message of us imaging, if you will, our view of heaven, both on earth and in the life hereafter. It's a, a great, description invitation for us to dream of what uh, heaven will be like and what perhaps heaven could be like here on earth especially in making this a better place made in the image and likeness of God and God living through us and calling each other to healing to more understanding more tolerance less division and being one as God's people. We reflect on God dwelling within each one of us, especially if, if he's to be here, we have to start with ourselves and see how he has taken root in us. His word, his life, his example, how it is planting that seed in us and bearing much fruit in the world and in our families as uh, the Oliver family has borne much fruit and continues to do so for several generations. And that's what it's all about, our legacy as the people of God. He makes us new, he gives us life-giving life water, and we share it with each other, seeking eternity. The uh, responsorial psalm that was sung from Psalm 23 uh, is one of consolation. 
and knowing that Christ, the Good Shepherd, the Father is also Shepherd, he is the one who cares for us, guides us, we commend ourselves to him as his sheep, and he gives us repose and rest. And that's what we ask, especially for Margaret and for all of our faithful departed, from our families and our friends. And that uh, he sits at the banquet table of goodness and kindness. And once again, as all the readings here say, we long to dwell with him in his pasture, life eternal. But we still have things to do here in the earth and the example of Margaret and others. In the reading from the first letter to the Thessalonians, it's also reassurance that God, and I know I've thought about this many, many times with my family, my parents, my beloved, that I, I want to know that they're okay and that I want to be with them again one day. And they with me. And so it says that uh, along with our beloved who will go, go before us, we too will follow. But we have to believe. But that we long that we be together as one, one day. That we be reunited with our, our family members and with our friends. And just uh, think about what that banquet might look like. The rejoicing the celebrating, the dancing, what kind of food and drink to be with those, uh, those wonderful people. This uh, Bread of Life discourse from John 6 that uh, Father Hector proclaimed, thank you for choosing this, uh, un unbelievable and for us as Catholics. Uh, it goes on and on about the Eucharist and <clears throat> basically about two things, about um, about receiving eternal life because we believe, and a lot of the readings at this time during Easter repeat this over and over again. We heard it last Sunday in the story about Thomas, doubting Thomas, who ended up being one of the greatest apostles of faith who said, my Lord and my God, and that we are invited to believe, and if we believe, we will have eternal life. The many things that get in the way during life, that challenge them, that give us doubt, all of us, just like Thomas. But we don't stop there, we work through it. In times like this, in times of loss, in times of difficulty, suffering, sacrifice, but also if we stay the course, and if we believe, if we keep the faith, God blesses us. God transforms our lives. He reconciles us. And we need to believe. As Catholics, we have a very specific belief um, in the Eucharist in the very presence of Jesus in his body and blood, and that Christ is the bread of life, and that when we receive him in the Eucharist, he sustains us. It's like food for us physically. This is spiritual food for the journey, for the road, and it is our, our greatest gift. And that's why we come together here every week, every day, to celebrate uh, the Mass and communion, to receive the body of Christ as the body of Christ. and. Uh, be bread, blessed, and broken for each other. <clears throat> Believe it or not, it'll be uh, 41 years ago this June that I arrived as the assistant pastor uh, here at St. Therese. Can you tell? That was in uh, 1980, the other millennium. And uh, I was then the boy priest. I'm the old priest, but that's okay. It's been such a journey and such a blessing and so much of my roots as a priest and as a minister were established here at St. Therese then. And then, and, and I did that with Father Bob Nevins as the pastor, Dick Brady as the deacon, and many, many wonderful other people, a few of which I will mention. But uh, then 18 years later, I didn't get it right the first time, so they sent me back. I was assigned back here in, in 2001, <clears throat> just before 9-11 in June of 2001, as the pastor. And a lot had changed here in the parish and in the school in the meantime. But, and change is, is not always easy, but it is good. And um, I was still very, very blessed to see that a lot of 
the old time families and their children and grandchildren were still here. If they weren't here, they came back for all the funerals and weddings and other special celebrations. And uh, I, I can't tell you what that, what that meant to me then. And to be here with you today as part of that legacy and heritage, very honored <clears throat> and very blessed. When I think back, um, <clears throat> coming back 18 years uh, later, um, first person I saw when I went over to the school in the front office was Margaret Oliver. And uh, she was standing there <clears throat> behind the counter and uh, continuing to be the face and heart all that time of that institution. And St. Teresa School and Parish have been here for a long time. They've been going on over, have you celebrated your 100th anniversary as a parish? Not yet, but um, Margaret, Margaret wasn't here quite a hundred years, but uh, <laughs> over half a century. And um, there she was, along with Joan O'Toole, meeting and greeting and smiling and welcoming and helping every man, woman, and especially child that came in that building. And doing it with such class and such goodness. Um, she had such what I call equanimity. She always was, was the same. Always that person with unbelievable calm, patience, kindness, giving, present, just pure grace and gentleness and always wanting to, to help, to welcome. And if we need anything as a world and a church right now, we need to be hospitable. We need to be welcoming. And boy, she, she embodied that in, in every way possible. And uh, I don't think I ever saw her mad. You kids, I'm sure, did. But. Um, one of my other memories of Margaret was her and Barry sitting just inside the door, right over there. And boy, nobody better have taken their place right there. And I can't remember, was it on Sunday morning that they came like to the eight o'clock mass? I can't remember what mass they came to on a regular basis, but they sat right by the, the south exit here. You can guess why, no. But, but so that's not a door that I came in very often, but I would intentionally and periodically go over there to say hi to them. And uh, Margaret always smiled and was pleasant, and Barry always had some s snide or witty quip that would get me laughing. I'd still be laughing when I was trying to start mass. And uh, it was always great to see them sitting there together. Together. Um, I, I know that I've met most of you over the years. I knew some of you better than others, but just uh, knew um, what, what a blessing your family was uh, to the parish and to many, many other families. I was sharing with, I can't remember if it was Ann and Tracy beforehand, that uh, this neighborhood back in the day was nothing more than marauding hundreds of kids from the Catholic families in this neighborhood. <laughs> and. Uh, and just playing everywhere and visiting everywhere and, and, and building up this community in such an incredible way. And I've seen it over and over again um, at funerals like this and also through the school. Um, there are so many people that could be named that uh, served in this, in this parish. Some of the priests, uh, Father, Father Nevins, Father Croak, uh, Father Hector, Myself, um, Deacon uh, Dick Brady, and other deacons. Also, uh, uh, Monsignor Jorge de los Santos is uh, one of the priests that served here as an associate, and Bishop Jorge Rodriguez. They were both my associates, or my parochial vicars when I was here. So now when I see them, I say, wow, you guys are now my boss. And uh, mis jefes. And, uh, and 
so many, many laity that have served the people of God here in, in this parish and in the community. All of the sisters, the sisters of charity of Leavenworth, um, oh my gosh, and you're gonna have to help me, your sister Mary Timothy, was it? Principal? And um, <clears throat> I also know that uh, Tony Baith was principal, um, Sister Marguerite, Sister Marjorie, um, Sister Jean that just passed, is that correct? And so many more. To it, oh my gosh, thank, th thank you so much. So many, hundreds of people. And um, thousands, I should say. There are many people that are created by God that are uh, just made for a family and for community, and Margaret was such a person. She had uh, 11 of her own children, 25 grandkids, 41 grandchildren, correct me if I'm wrong, and uh, she probably had at least 11,000 other children that came through the school in this parish, maybe 100,000, I'm not sure, but many, many thousand. And um, look at the, uh, the good that has come from that. So for approximately 40 years, she served in the school and 60 years here in the parish, I think, approximately. What greater countenance, face, person of God would you want giving, serving, greeting, and caring for you and your children than Margaret Oliver? And many people could testify to that. We make a big deal about the saints in the Catholic Church and rightly so. I love preaching about the saints, especially during the week. And uh, Margaret was a living saint. She was a model, an example of Christ and all the men and women that have gone before us that have, have served so faithfully and so lovingly. And um, she, uh, she was vibrant, alive, always there, concerned about others. She was that self-emptying vessel that always was there to, to show her joy, to sacrifice, I'm sure you know that, especially as family, and um, was always concerned and always there to celebrate in abundance with us. An encounter with Margaret Oliver was to know by the way that she stood with you that you are a child of God beyond a shadow of a doubt. And that she affirmed you as such. I do uh, remember um, going over to your house a couple of times. We were just talking about that. And Bob Bialka is, is your neighbor too. We're on Galena and I was saying that the Raffles lived on the other side of Sixth Avenue on Galena as well, and many, many other families. Um, not, we've had a lot of vocations from this parish, both religious men and women, and uh, I'm trying to remember, Monsignor Bernie Schmitz is from this parish, and uh, I know that there are a lot of priests, some of whom are still alive, that, that served here, uh, Father, uh, Father uh, Paleman, and, and many, many other priests that also were called to that vocation. We say thank you, Margaret, for being such a gift to this community and to the world. And I want to thank the Oliver family for uh, sharing in her gifts and uh, for the effect and good that you're sharing with the world. We need your example. We need your presence. For your father, Barry, too. For your grandpa and great-grandpa. It's a celebration of life and eternal life. It's a celebration of bread and wine, of banquet, maybe some meat in there too. <laughs> do you still have the meat market? Yeah. Oh, you do? Oh, good. Maybe we'll have some later. Not even. We share that banquet in faith and joy as the children of God. And as I would usually do at the end of my Masses, I have to share one story with you. I don't know if you know, but on the 50th anniversary of Barry and Margaret, that your dad, your grandpa, got down on one knee 
and reenacted his proposal to Margaret. And then he proposed to her, she accepted, and he knelt there and kept kneeling there. <laughs> and kept kneeling there and she said, and now what? And he said, help me up. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and sits at the right hand of the Father, where he intercedes for his church. Confident that God hears the voices of those who trust in the Lord Jesus, we join our prayers to his. In baptism, Margaret received the light of Christ. Scatter the, the darkness now and lead her over the waters of death. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayers. Our sister Margaret was nourished at the table of the Savior. Welcome her into the halls of the heavenly banquet. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Our sister spent her life following Jesus, poor, chaste, and obedient. Count her among all the holy men and women who sing in your courts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our responses. Hear our prayer. Many friends and members of our families have gone before us and await the kingdom. Grant them an everlasting home with your Son. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Many people die by violence, war, and famine each day. Show your mercy to those who suffer so unjustly these sins against your love, and gather them to the eternal kingdom of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Those who trust in the Lord now sleep in the Lord. Give refreshment, rest, and peace to all whose faith is known to you alone. I would especially like to remember John and Teresa McCarthy. Barry and Christopher Oliver, Eileen Sullivan, Francis Smith, and great-granddaughter Sonoma Chapman. For the repose of their souls and the consolation of your family, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We are assembled in faith and confidence to pray for Margaret. Strengthen our hopes so that we may live in the expectation of your son's coming. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, giver of peace and healer of souls, hear the prayers of the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, and the voices of your people whose lives were purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Forgive the sins of all who sleep in Christ. Grant them a place in your kingdom where you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
sacrifice and mine might be acceptable to God, the loving Father. Amen. Look favorably on our offerings, O Lord, so that your departed servant, Margaret, may be taken up into glory with your Son, in whose great mystery of love we are all united through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In him the hope of blessed resurrection is gone, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful, Lord, life is changed and not ended. And when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, no eternal dwelling is made ready for them. And an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven. And so, with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. <laughs> In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. mystery of faith.
Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, and Samuel, our Bishop, Jorge, his assistant, and all the clergy. Remember your servant, Margaret Oliver, whom you have called from this world to yourself. Grant that she who was united with your son in a death like his may also be one with him in his resurrection. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, Saint Therese, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be coerced to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever.
reception of Holy Communion. All Catholics are invited who are in the state of grace to receive Holy Communion. And those who cannot receive or are not Catholic or would like a blessing, please come forward. Just cross your arms so we know to give you a blessing. Father and I will be distributing the communion here on each side of the middle aisle. Thank you.
11 children over the course of 53 years of marriage until his death in 2012. And subsequently, they also enjoyed the arrival of 22 grandchildren and later 41 great-grandchildren. She was a loyal parishioner of St. Teresa Church for over 60 years and worked at St. Teresa School for almost 40 years. She was a fervent supporter of St. Teresa and Mashpeth High School sports, and she loved her times in Colorado in the mountains immensely. One of my memories of my mom was one day I saw her looking through one of her old yearbooks from St. Francis High School, and I noticed many, many mentions of someone named Patches. And I had to ask her, who is this Patches? And she went on to tell me that was a nickname that she had received early on in life, and it was representative of the repairs that her mother, Teresa, performed on all of her clothes. Um, so I'm really thinking about it. what is a patch? It can be on clothing, or for some of our younger generation, um, uh, on a computer, but it's a remedy that fixes the immediate need. Um, and while it's fixing that immediate need, it still allows the rest of the operating unit to, re to remain functioning as a whole. And so when I really reflected back upon it, Patches really was a very appropriate nickname for my mom. Originally, by her childhood friends, it may have been made in jest, but it really, for her, became a badge of pride and one that she truly embraced. It became a sign of distinction, and ultimately an emblem of her perseverance that ended up being passed down across many generations. And, and I think about the time in my life when I witnessed, either through anecdotal stories or firsthand, of how my own mom really became that fix, the patch. Um, when I asked my sister Reed about it, she has memories of being distraught in grade school, about trying to find ideas for school projects. And, and Margaret was always finding creative solutions to help save the day. Uh, my sister Roberta, uh, she reflected upon those times when my mom would teach um, the grade school girls in my family to harmonize for school talent shows, um, including, including three times uh, when they won ribbons for their talents. Uh, my brother Richard, uh, one of my early memories when Rich was about age 17 and he had four wisdom teeth pulled and he was so heavily sedated by the anesthesia that when Margaret drove him home in the family's uh, green station wagon, he just absolutely refused to get out. And being much larger than my mom, um, eventually she was able to use her powerful uh, persuasion to get him to finally get up and walk on into the house. Uh, my brother Jim, at age eight, uh, Jim always being adventurous, climbed to the very top of the tallest tree at, at our cabin, and when the branch he was on broke, he hit every branch on the way down and ultimately uh, broke his collarbone upon hitting the ground. And, and there he is, my mom, holding him uh, through the entire 60 minute drive to the nearest hospital in Loveland. Um, my brother Bill, um, there was always a family tradition um, of always bringing the newborn babies up to the cabin the weekend immediately after their birth, kind of a rite of passage. Um, unfortunately, the weekend that Bill got brought up for his uh, first trip to the mountains, uh, he was feasted upon by a bunch of unseen gnats, uh, leaving my mom to uh, kind of tend to console and soothe um, an injured newborn. Uh, my sister Rosie. Um, at age 17, when Rosie's uh, prom date came to the house to pick her up for the dance, it was Margaret who was able to keep Rosie's annoying 12-year-old brother away from her date as he kept trying to embarrass her. Um, my sister Ann. I heard her senior year of high school um, when her brother Bill decided he was going to run her over with his car as they were attempting to jump the battery of the Green Station wagon. It was Margaret who calmly assessed the situation, gathered up all the paperwork that was going to be required uh, to make sure that Ann could get admitted into the emergency room immediately and that treatment could begin. Uh, my sister Mary, when at age 23, when she was injured in a horrific car crash in California that left her in a coma for four weeks, it was Margaret who immediately rushed to California and spent weeks at her bedside and later assisted with months of rehabilitation back in Colorado. Uh, for myself, you know, I, I remember for many of the planned Sunday night uh, dinners of the famous Johnny uh, Bazzetti meal, I would faint stomach ailments, and, and Margaret would allow me to just go lay down and instead nibble on uh, salty and crackers, and thus being able to avoid that culinary delight. <laughs> um, uh, Chris, after being, my brother Chris, after being diagnosed with uh, spinal meningitis at the age of 11, uh, Margaret stayed with him uh, for weeks at the hospital and later helped him uh, with additional weeks of rehabilitation at home. And later in life, when Chris uh, passed away, she provided all of us with comfort and the calming 
peace of mind knowing that Chris was now closer with God. And my sister Tracy, one of her most poignant memories of my mom was when she was in high school and college, um, while she was still going to school and trying to work a job, and my mom helping type her up her school papers for her. Uh, Tracy would handwrite the papers and then Margaret would type them up for her. Um, as Tracy stated, she truly made things special. As we rarely got treats, when we did, it always made us feel that we were even much more um, appreciative of that. Um, it could be something simple, a box of cereal for a birthday, or even roasting marshmallows at the cabin. As our children got older, Patches would then extend her skills of helping others repair, rebuild, and mend whatever was needed. Whether assisting the grandchildren and later her great-grandchildren, uh, helping with the shares program at church, or guiding new families to become acclimated with St. Tree School, Margaret was always finding innovative ways to fix the problem of others. Her childhood name was Patches, but she maintained a mentality of being determined to move on ahead and solve every other obstacle that was facing others. We will always remember and affectionately love you, Patches, as our Patches. Thank you. so much for being with us uh, tonight reciting at Margaret's funeral and uh, what an inspiring homily. Um, I, I have known Margaret for the past uh, eight years here, almost eight years, and, uh, and I can only briefly elaborate on what Father Bird already, uh, uh, you know, so it's a beautiful way he did, but I have been thinking about her, you know, since her passing in a special way and, and praying uh, praying for her and uh, praying with her witness as well. And uh, let me just offer you uh, an image or a series of images. Um, first of all, just think about uh, the Garden of Eden and how Adam and Eve uh, were uh, absolutely perfect in their humanity. And, uh, and one of the aspects of that perfection was what we call integrity meaning that there was a perfect harmony between uh, the reason, uh, their will, free will, and their emotions. It's a perfect harmony. We do not know what, what that is like. But Christ Jesus, especially in his resurrection, wants to uh, uh, reinstill with, uh, within us that integrity. So that's what holiness means, uh, pursuing that uh, integration. And, and that happens mainly uh, due to two uh, other gifts that he offers to us. First of all, the gift of his grace, and then the gift of virtue. Grace and virtue. So through the power of God's grace, which is uh, his divine life, and through the power of virtue, which is uh, basically uh, using our God-given faculties to pursue true goodness. Uh, through those two gifts, we are able to progressively attain that integrity, that integration between reason, free will, and emotion, which is another way of speaking about holiness. Um, there was a clear sense in which grace and virtue were shining in Margaret's life. And uh, it's amazing, uh, as the days uh, go by, I hear more and more stories about her and that conviction becomes even further. Grace and virtue were very strong in her life. That's why, uh, you know, Father Bird so perfectly called her a living saint. There was such integration in her, such integrity, because of that abundance of grace and virtue. An image of grace in her has to do with, with the sacraments. Uh, and yes, she continued to sit, you know, by the south south door during my years here, so I always knew, um, you know, that, uh, that Margaret would be there. She loved the Mass because she loved Christ in the Eucharist. Christ Jesus was her life. I visited with her on Wednesday of uh, Holy Week, and uh, I brought her Holy Communion, and I anointed her with uh, the oil from the sick. And 
and, uh, and she was truly in excruciating pain. She was barely able to, to talk because of uh, the suffering that she was enduring. But I was totally amazed uh, by what her main concern was at the time. And her main concern was not um, the terrible pain in which she found herself, but it was the fact that she was not going to be able to come to Mass on Easter Sunday. That was her true concern. That was the great suffering that she was enduring at the time. Not being able to receive Christ in the Eucharist for Easter. Uh, realize that uh, her final agony was in a way identical with that of Christ in the sense that she was actually dying on Good Friday, the day when our Lord passed away. And she died uh, early in the morning of Holy Saturday, being united uh, with Christ in his burial. And so in faith, we trust that uh, it was God's plan for her to rejoice on Easter Sunday uh, with the fullness of Mass, so to speak, with the perfect banquet feast, which is heaven. The abundance of grace in her life. But, as we know, grace builds upon nature, which means that if the grace of God is to flourish in our lives, we need to be fully intent in practicing virtue, pursuing a life of goodness without counting the cost. And once again, the more I hear stories about her life, the more I see clearly how many virtues she had. She was a woman of virtue. There was a solid goal of goodness in her. And that is why uh, the grace of God was so powerfully active in her life. So just briefly, two images about two virtues that it's very clear that Margaret had uh, to an uh, exceeding uh, degree. First of all, uh, laboriousness. She was a very hard-working woman, very hard-working. Um, perhaps Steve Vaughan, a principal, might recall when you know, we were getting ready you know, to go back uh, to in-person uh, uh, learning at the school. One of the first uh, staff members uh, who was ready to be back in the building was Margaret. <laughs> uh, but I honestly were concerned by <laughs> You know, she was one of the first staff members to be ready uh, to get back in the building. And so, you know, she was one of the first um, staff members to uh, go back to work. And uh, she continued to work uh, until she was literally able to do so. It was less than 10 days before her death that she was actually working at her desk. What a tremendous witness of the virtue of hard work. And then perhaps uh, one of the strongest virtues that she had was the virtue of kindness. She was truly a loving, kind, compassionate uh, woman. A staff member came to me after uh, her passing, and uh, you know, with grief, the person said to me, Father, I, I, I knew Margaret for years. And she was always kind to me. I never heard it, uh, uh, you know, I never heard her speaking ill of anyone. She was always good to me. She always had a kind word, a word of encouragement. And I can definitely uh, give witness to that myself. She was always kind to me. And her kind of especially touching uh, to me because of her kindness to my mom. And if you know anything about me, you know that my mom and I are very, very close. For most of the pandemic, she has been with me at the rectory. And my mom and Margaret are about the same age. And every time they would you know, come inside you know, in the parking lot or a church or uh, whatever the place might be, Margaret would make, make a point to you know, go to my mom and, uh, uh, and talk to her and show kindness to her. My mom tells me the story. I was not there. Um, uh, she was coming back from the grocery store, my mom. And uh, she was, you know, uh, taking the groceries from the car to the, 
to the rectory, and Margaret was there, and, and she wanted to carry the groceries for my mom. <laughs> you know, it's like, both of them needed help. <laughs> but she was there, willing to serve. In the days to come, as we continue to uh, grieve uh, for her loss, let us also be aware that the Lord Jesus wants to uh, bless us with a profound um, sense of hope. Not hopefulness, but the virtue of hope, which is that certain conviction, that full certainty that God has prepared for each one of us a dwelling place in heaven, and that He will give us every single possible grace we might need in this life in order to be able to go to heaven. In seeing the, 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 the beautiful version of grace in Margaret's life, we trust in faith and in hope that even now or very soon, she will be waiting for us at that beautiful uh, mansion that the Lord has created for her from the beginning of the world. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if when the time comes for all of us to uh, be reunited with her, we may discover that that beautiful mansion in heaven for Margaret is a little cabin by the mountains. Trusting in God, we have prayed together with Margaret Oliver, and now we come to the last farewell. There is sadness in parting, but we take comfort in the hope that one day we shall see Margaret again and enjoy her friendship. Although this congregation will disperse in sorrow, the mercy of God will gather us together again in the joy of his kingdom. Therefore, let us console one another.
we commend our sister Margaret Oliver in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, she will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessing, blessings which you bestowed upon Margaret in this life. There are signs to us of your goodness and our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn toward us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant and help us we may to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with our sister forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. May the angels lead you into paradise. May the martyrs come to welcome you and take you to the holy city, the new and eternal Jerusalem. 